Hey guys, welcome back to your Lake Fort Guide. Got another episode of the Guides Network. Today, we're going to talk about one of the most important subjects that you can learn, study, get better at when it comes to bass fishing. You know, these bass boats these days are extremely expensive. And a lot of the stuff that comes on them is extremely expensive from all your tackle, your trolling motors that lock you in place, your power poles that anchor you in shallow water, but one of the more expensive ones and definitely one of the most important, very utmost important tools that you have when it comes to bass fishing are your electronic units. So today we're going to talk about in-depth settings, how to get the most out of the sonar on your electronics. All right guys, so here we are. These are my Lowrance carbon units, but a lot of these settings will apply to most electronic units, especially just about every model of Lowrance that you can think of. So first thing we wanna do, let's go to menu by pushing the page button up here. We're gonna go into settings, and then we're gonna go into sonar, and then we're gonna go into installation. Now this will apply more to your front graph on the bow of your boat, but source this unit channel one. So what you'll see, this says HCS carpet channel one. They're both channel one. Those, this graph is only set up to read off of my rear transducer. But your front graph, your bow graph, will have an option to read the back transducer or the transducer that is mounted in your trolling motor head itself. Now, most of the transducers mounted in your trolling motor head are not gonna give you down scan, side scan, uh, only gonna give you sonar and mapping. But for me, I always choose this unit on my front graph because I want that sonar shooting directly under the front of my boat for when I'm doing vertical fishing. Fishing mode, general use will get you done. For bass fishing guys, general use is all you need to know. They have deep water, fresh water, salt water, shallow water, slow trolling, fast trolling, clear water, ice fishing. This unit will do anything you want it to do, but these units are made as they come out of the box for bass fishing. That is the target audience, that's the, mo the people, most of the people that are using these units are going bass fishing and these units kind of come ready set up for bass fishing so general use is the best setting you can pick for bass fishing purposes transducer type guys i've never known exactly what type of transducer i have i've always selected unknown i've never had an issue with it uh, if you are having some type of issue and you're trying to troubleshoot it yourself one of the first things you want to look at is you want to do some investigating, find out exactly what type of transducer you have, and then if you're having issues getting your graph to read clear, you're getting a lot of interference, make sure you get the right setting on your transducer type. Myself, I don't have any issues, and I don't know what my transducer type is, so I simply select unknown. All right, so now I'm gonna exit out of installation. Now we're gonna talk about our settings over here. Now one of the unique things, and I'm just gonna start from top to bottom, kind of take you guys through all of it. Uh, the depth range is really important. Right here we're sitting in about 12, 13 foot of water. Um, but you can set the range right here. A lot of people will use auto. I use auto for a long time. I've since stopped using auto thanks to my good buddy Captain Ron who taught me a little trick with my down scan and my sonar. I go off of auto and I select a certain depth. Now on Lake Fork, and most of the lakes that I fish offshore in the summertime, we're fishing anywhere from 20 to 25 foot of water, maybe a little deeper than that, but very, very rarely will we fish deeper than 30 foot of water. So I like to select 35 foot of water because anything that's below that, I really don't need to see. So I'll actually, I've got a custom depth and you can see it comes in kind of 10 foot increments here. But if you want, if you look down here in the bottom, you'll see custom. So if you, let's say you got 30 foot and 40 foot, which were the two options I had. Well, I wanted 35 because I want to be able to see 20 to 25 and see a good section of bottom at the bottom of my map. So I went in here to custom and you can enter any number you want. So upper range, you can knock off part of the top where you zoom in on it. So let's say I'm fishing from 20 to 25 foot of water. So if I really want to get a tight shot between 20 and 25, I can punch in 0015 okay on my upper range then i can go down here and punch in 0030 on my lower range now what that's going to do 
doesn't do us any, show us anything but dirt. But as you can see, I'm only seeing from 15 to 30. Well, if I'm fishing from 20 to 25, this is going to be my key zone, and I'm going to get a better, more zoomed in, more detailed look. But the one thing that is important to me is I want to keep this at a constant range. That way the arcs, the fish that I see, like you're going to see here in a second, those arcs always stay the same size. Whether I see them in 15 foot of water or I see them in 25 foot of water, they will remain the same size. It allows me to train myself and teach myself how to judge the size of fish more efficiently. That's how we do depth range. Hertz, 200 hertz is going to get you through all bass fishing needs. You really don't need to use any other settings. Uh, if you're fishing super deep, if you're doing some, if you're watching this video and you're fishing up north and you're fishing halibut or something crazy, 83 hertz will work better for extreme deep situations. I don't know when you'd be fishing for bass in 100 foot of water, but if you are, you're gonna wanna go to 83 hertz. 200 hertz is gonna work better for all bass fishing situations. All right, let's go in here to advanced. In advanced, Noise rejection and surface clarity. So let's talk about that for a second. You can turn these off and it will give you more information. It'll also give you more junk. One of the beautiful things about these units is they're very efficient, very effective. As you can see, if we were in a lot of current right now, you'd be getting a lot of disturbance in the graph. Uh, you can see up here at the top the difference when I turned the surface clarity off. You can see what a difference it made and all the junk. Now, I've heard it said that you want this turned off to see things at the top, in the top few feet. But please tell me how I can see a ball of bait in all that junk right there. You can't. Actually having that on low will actually help you see things near the surface. So if you've got a small school of fish or a single fish or a ball of bait that comes under your boat closer to the surface, having your uh, surface clarity on low will help you. Noise rejection is really just gonna keep your screen cleaner and let you see the harder return items and eliminate some of the, the debris and some of the current and some of the stuff that's drifting through the water columns. A lot of these lakes, most of the lakes that we fish when it comes to bass fishing are gonna have a lot of junk in the water. These fertile fisheries, these fertile habitats are gonna have a lot of stuff in the water, be it minuscule bait, be it some type of plankton, be it silt, be it pieces of grass. You don't want all that junk cluttering up your screen. So I like to go with low, on surface clarity and low on noise rejection. Scroll speed, I have it normal. You can speed it up. If you're trying to graph a big area, I would not suggest this for looking at fish. So if, if you get to hitting your gas pedal while you're idling, you kind of high idle, you're gonna miss fish on your unit. But if you're doing that to find structure, you can do it and just hit the up button. It'll go times three, times four, and you can see my graph moving a lot faster now. But normal is what you wanna do especially when you're trying to look at fish and identify fish, you always want to have it on normal. You always want to be driving at kind of your slowest idle speed, maybe a little bit faster, but you really don't want to go faster than three and a half, maybe four miles an hour at the most is all you want to travel or you will miss some of those fish. All right guys, so we're talking about ping. I got my ping speed on max. When we're talking about pings. The ping is sending a signal down and back up to the graph. I always use mine on max because I want the most information possible uh, i want that thing to read as many times as it can in a short space you know one thing about a ping is kind of neat is it sends a signal down and the reason you get arcs on your graph the reason these fish show up as arcs on your graph like we're going to show you here in a minute is think of it like my voice if i'm talking to this knucklehead over here and i'm talking directly to him and my mouth is pointing this way the strongest part of my voice goes right here but this guy that's over here he can hear me too but it creates a cone. That's exactly the same way the ping works. It sends a cone signal down. The strongest part of it is directly underneath you. It gets weaker as it goes out to the sides. Sometimes you'll see arcs that are kind of broken. Well, they just went on the side of your ping cone. They didn't get right in the middle. When they get right in the middle, that's when you get that ping. And the way it works, it sends a signal down it reads density, sends a signal back up, and it tells that sonar, turn a green light on for this, turn a red light on for this, turn a yellow light on for this. It, turn, it simply goes down, comes back up, reading the density, and tells it to turn a light on. But always keep your ping speed at max. I, I like to think of it like this. If I was reading a book, I wouldn't want to skip chapters. I wouldn't want to miss out on words. I wouldn't want to have half my words blanked out of my book. I want to read every single word in that book. I want as much information coming back to me as possible through my ping speed, so therefore I always use max ping speed. All right, so that's going to back us out of advanced. Now let's go to sensitivity. You know, the, like I said, these units come out of the box so much so ready to go that auto sensitivity is great. Now, 
when I want to see a little more, we've got some type of a little fish right down here on the bottom in about 10 foot of water. So let's turn that up and see what we see. Okay, now as you see, I'm picking up more junk, more clutter, more debris in the water. I can still see this fish. He, st he shows up as a harder return. But if I turn it down below auto, go auto minus, well, I can get it down here where I won't even see that fish. Now that fish is gone altogether. But keeping it on auto is a good rule of thumb. I'm gonna try to find you guys a school of fish here in a minute, and you'll see me tweak this up and down. And a lot of times I will actually tweak my graph down some because I wanna take away the smaller species, the little glass minnows, the little flicker shad, just the little minuscule life sources that are in the water column. I wanna get those off my graph and only see the bass, especially the bigger bass, and the bigger sources of bait is the only thing I wanna see. So the way that I do that is by doing Auto Plus. I think Auto Plus is one of the best features that you have on your electronic units, on these Lorances especially, because it allows you to stay in a good safe setting but tweak your sensitivity up and down without having to be real advanced. Now you can turn Auto off and turn it on percentage if you're old school, but it basically functions the same way. The higher the sensitivity, the more junk you're going to see, the lower the less. And if I was going to do auto sensitivity, it'd be somewhere 60 to 65, right around 65%, maybe 63, 62, somewhere in there would look good to me. Color line. Uh, I use palette 13. Now your color line is going to vary some depending on which palette you're using. Uh, for me, I like palette 13, and we'll talk more about palette here in just a second. But 76%. On palette 13 works really well for me. Basically what you want to do is you want to find the color line that distinguishes all your colors, which you can see at the top of the screen, the best. So if I jump up, okay, now my greens are getting blurred with my yellows and my blues with my reds. But if I go down too low, well now I kind of don't have some of my yellows and my green. So 76% is the sweet spot for me on palette 13 where I really get that yellow, I really get that green, I really get that red, and I really get that blue. I've actually got four colors in palette 13 that really help me identify the density of the structure and the fish that I'm looking at. All right, let's go into view. So there's some neat things going on in view. First, since we just talked about the color line, let's talk about palettes. Like I told you guys, I like palette 13, but you can use palette one. Now on palette one, let's back back out and look at our color line. If we turn down our color line on palette one, it'll actually kind of identify the colors a little better. See the difference in the yellow, the, the orangish, reddish, and the blue? Whereas if I turn it up, they kind of start blurring together a little bit. If you can see right up here at the top, they're all mixed together. So if I was to use palette one, then I would have my color line more down between 65 and 70, right around 67, 68, 69, that all looks good. The palette that you use is simply a personal preference. I like 13. Uh, one of the reasons that I like 13 is you guys can see right here I've got brown dirt. When I have brown dirt, if there's anything on top of this dirt whatsoever, it's going to show me. If there's a, a thin layer of gravel, if there's short grass, new grass growth that's just starting, if there's a little bit of a shell build up on top of a ridge, I'll be able to see these colors up at the top. I need to go back and fix my color line. I'll be able to see using these colors at the top, and it'll tell me how dense, how hard that is. So if I were to see a little line of shell stacking up on this bottom right here, I would see a line on top of that brown that would have a little bit of green in the middle of it, or it could be, uh, maybe it's some gravel or something like that, anything that's hard. Now if it's grass, it's gonna be kind of reddish, bluish, and maybe a little bit of yellow in the grass. Uh, if there was a thin layer of grass starting to grow here, you'd see little pieces of grass sticking up in those colors. So. One thing about the palette you choose, your softest return will be at the bottom and your hardest return will always be at the top. So as you can see, this palette right here goes from blue to red to yellow to green. That little thin line of green at the top, that's your hardest return. That's gonna be real important when we talk about identifying fish here in a minute. Okay, temperature graph. Temperature graph will make this move up and down as the temperature changes in the water column throughout the day. I never use it though, but that's what it does. Um, I don't know what depth line does, if I'm being honest with you guys, it puts a little blue line down here. I never use depth line. Amplitude scope, this is neat. This is very similar to an old flasher right here, but I wanna show you guys something. This is similar to an old flasher. You can see it with your sonar, but these units actually up here at Split, they have an actual flasher. So this, if you guys are old school and you really like the old flashers the best, you don't need to go buy an old flasher and mount it next to your regular Lowrance unit 
like uh, what David Fritz does. You can actually take this unit right here and view both sonar and flasher at the same time. Uh, zoom just gives you two different screens where you can zoom one in, uh, keep one zoomed out, keep one zoomed in. Uh, that works well if you're really trying to see detail. In so if you're using sonar to see some detail in the hardness of the bottom content or you know something that's on the bottom, uh, a brush pile, anything like that, you want to zoom in and really check it out, this screen comes in handy for that. I run no split and actually use down imaging for most of that stuff myself. Okay guys, that's how I set my graphs up. Now let's take them over here, see if we can't find a school of fish for you guys to look at and play with some of these settings while we're looking at fish and show you guys how to identify these bass using these settings we just talked to you about. Okay, there's one single good size big bass. You can kind of look over here on the side, see that fish is almost a foot tall because halfway between 10 and 12 is 11. So that fish is probably a 10 inch tall fish. Now let's tweak that sensitivity up and see what it does. See how you can still see them, but the rest of your water, water column gets real cluttered when you have the sensitivity too high. If you go down too low, the fish completely disappears altogether. Put it right back on auto, it's good. I like auto plus two. See right there when I went up to plus two, plus three? When I went to plus two, it showed me a little more detail in the depth of that fish. These are all bass scattered along this ridge right here. All good fish. There's a little tiny one. Most of these are good. There's one of the broken arcs we talked about. That is a bass. It's just like these other ones. The difference is that fish did not go directly under our sonar, so we did not get as good of a reading on that one. There, and here's a ball of shad off the side of the structure. Got some small fish scattered around it, hunting it down. Here comes another ball of bait right here. One thing about ball of bait when you're reading it, I'd rather see this shape than this shape. This is more of a perfectly round shape. When they start getting, when the, when the ball of shad starts getting extended and broken up, to me that says something is chasing that ball of shad. And if I'm seeing shad, I want my shad to be scared. I don't like comfortable shad. You like comfortable shad? Not in the comfortable shad. I'm not in the comfortable shad. We'll scroll back so you guys can kind of see this a little better real quick. So there's our sensitivity. We showed you what we do. We tweak it up, get a little more detail. There's the side of the cone fish. Don't get discouraged when your fish look like this. They're not necessarily little. You just didn't get a good hard read on them. When you get a good hard read, they'll be good arcs just like these are right here. And then you can look at the height on the side and kind of judge. Always judge the size of the fish by the height of it. Depending on how fast I go over him, how fast he goes under me, this length can always change. If he stays under my transducer for a long time, that sucker can be as long as the graph is wide, but his height will always be the same and you've got a good measuring tool right over here. Okay, let's look at what color line does. So if we get the wrong color line, we can't tell the difference in the colors. They start blurring together. Some of them don't even show up anymore. If you get too high, again, you don't get to see all the colors. You can see how when you get too high, the lower range colors disappear altogether. So you really want to be able to see all the colors for that graph to show you all the detail. And on Palette 13, 76% seems to get that job done. Now, one thing I will tell you, down scan is a good tool to use with sonar. I think it's very important to use down scan with sonar. I think neither one is as good without the other. One kind of confirms the other. So let's switch to both. All right, now you can start to see some dots. See how these fish show up as dots right here? These, you know, that could be anything. That could be a stump. That could be anything on the bottom. You see one stump right there. But you see these dots that are off the bottom? Well, boys, there's only one thing those dots are going to be, and that's fish. And the sharper and brighter your dot is, the bigger the fish is. That's how downscan works as far as what you're looking at on your fish. Now guys, we kind of cheated a little bit because we caught some fish out of this school already. So I knew they were here. They're a lot more scattered than they were earlier. Here's a couple shots of what that school looked like when we first found them. Now, one thing I will say, let's say I'm riding along here at A plus two and let's say I'm see, see this debris that's starting to show up right here. We'll go back to just sonar for this. See I'm picking up debris in the water, junk in the water. If I'm seeing that, I'll tweak my sensitivity down. Because if I'm seeing that, I'm going to see every tiny minuscule bait fish, stuff that I really just don't want to see. Like that's, I don't really need to know this is here. This is nothing of any importance to me. You see how I'm seeing this debris? I don't want to see that. So I'll actually turn this down back to my A plus two and I almost don't see that. If I go to auto, I really don't see it. Now when I'm on auto, I know if I see a good arc on here, it's going to be a good fish. If I see a good ball of bait, it's going to be a good ball of bait. It's not going to be something that's insignificant to me. 
Well guys, that's how I use my sonar. That's all the in-depth settings that I can give you. Uh, set it up like that. What I can tell you more so than anything, especially with sensitivity and color line. That's a constant moving target. You need to adjust those at times. I always am adjusting my sensitivity and color line depending on what palette I'm using, depending on the lake I'm in, how silted it is, how clear the water is, how deep I'm fishing. All these things can change your settings that you need to optimize the use of your electronic units. So experiment with those. It's really easy if you use that auto plus auto minus to change your sensitivity. It's really easy to change the color line up and down when you change palettes. So don't be scared to get in there and try to use these things to the maximum ability. More than anything, it's just like fishing. There's no substitute, no shortcut for time on the water in bass fishing, and there's no uh, shortcut to time behind your electronics. The more time you spend looking at fish and then verifying what you see by catching them, you will gain confidence, you will begin to learn to use those things more efficiently, and you'll get more dialed in. So I encourage all of you to get out there and do it. Hey, I certainly hope this video helps you guys. If you need some great tackle to catch some of these offshore fish, go check out sixcentsfishing.com. If you order any baits over there, be sure you punch in that code, your Lake Fork Guide, you'll get a 10% discount on all orders. We also want to thank Smash Tech Baits for helping us out like they do. We couldn't do what we do without the people like Smash Tech Baits, Lose Fishing, Amphibia Eye Gear. We've got all that stuff linked below in the description. So if you're looking for some new gear, some new tackles, some new hot baits that'll catch some really big bass like we're always doing right here on the Year Lake Fort Guide channel, go check out the sponsors link below. Hey, we appreciate you guys watching and we'll see you next time right here on Your Lake Fort Guide.